Hello friends, this video on gravitation part 2 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So the universal law of gravitation stated that every body in the universe attracts every other body with a force which is directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So Newton said that whatever object whatever thing which we see in this universe whether this is human beings whether it is table chair furniture whatever it is every object will attract every other object with a force which is directly proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects and inversely proportional to the distance between them that means if two objects are lying very close to each other the distance between them is less. Therefore, the force with which they attract each other would be more. Right? So, let us look at this example. Let us suppose you have a ball and you have another box which are both lying at some distance, say R. So, the universal law states that these two objects will tend to attract each other. But have you ever observed a ball, if you keep a ball on a table and another box on the table, do they actually start moving towards each other? No. Why don't they move towards each other? That's because the force with which they are attracting each other is very small. Or any object will start moving only when the force on them is considerably more. The greater the force, the greater the movement of the object which you will observe, right? So now in this case what happens the force with which they attract each other that is directly proportional to product of their masses if the mass of this ball is m1 and the mass of this box is m2 so this force is directly proportional to m1 m2 and this force is inversely proportional to the distance between them if we assume that the distance between the two objects is r so that means the Farther away you take the objects from each other, the force between them will become lesser. The closer they are brought together, the force between them would be higher, right? Now, please keep in mind this, keep this point in mind that every time, I mean, every object which we see around us, everything is attracting every other thing. If you keep two pens lying very close to each other, they are attracting each other. But you do not see any motion because of that attraction. That is because the force with which they are attracting is very less. Right? Okay. So now let us look at the history of the planetary motion. As I said, the law of gravitation played a very crucial role. It played a significant role in explaining the motion of the planets in the solar system. Right. So this planetary motion was an important topic of uh, research and study in those days. I mean, not only those days, even now, people do a lot of research work on uh, planetary motion and planets. But those days also, uh, people were trying to find out actually what governs the motion of the planets around the sun. So let us quickly look at how, uh, I mean, what work did other people do and how Newton got information from their work. So this work on planetary motion actually started long back uh, with a, a scientist named Ptolemy. So he gave a model which was known as geocentric model. Geo, geo means earth, right? Geocentric, earth centric. That means what did he consider? He told that all planets, stars and sun revolve around the earth. So he thought this, this guy Ptolemy th thought that Earth is the center, Earth is the head, okay. So he said that Earth was at the center and all other planets, stars, sun, everything else were actually revolving around the Earth. So Earth was at the center. After some time came another, came some group of Indian astronomers who proposed the heliocentric model. So heliocentric model said that all planets revolve around the sun. So this model suggested that no, Earth was not at the center. Instead, Sun is at the center and all other planets are actually revolving around the Sun. Again, few years later came up Nicholas Copernicus. So he gave the Copernicus model in which he said that planets move in circles around the central Sun. So if you see in with passage of time, 
some scientists did some research work and they started adding on to the information. Initially, somebody told that Earth was at the center. Then some scientists came and told that no sun is at the center. Now, another model came up which said that, yeah, you are right, sun is at the center. But all planets are moving around the sun in circular path. Then came up another scientist called Tycho Brahe. So Tycho Brahe too, he spent his entire lifetime recording observations on planets. So he also wanted to derive something. He also wanted to conclude something on planetary motion. But he ran short of time. Throughout his lifetime, he only kept recording observations. I mean, how do you think all these things were uh, actually proposed? They were proposed based on experimentation. So scientists did a lot of experiments and observations and they make, they noted or they recorded all their observations and based on which they gave such proposals. So this person Tycho Brahe, he spent his lifetime recording observation on planets, however could not conclude anything concrete. But then came Johannes Kepler, who gave the Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So Kepler's laws of planetary motion were something which were considered full and final on planetary motion. So he gave his three laws, Kepler's first law, second law and third law. And these three laws together completely explained the planetary motion to a large extent. So Kepler made use of the data which were collected by Tycho Brahe. Right? Now, these Kepler's laws were the basis of Newton's universal law of gravitation. So, Newton got the idea of gravitation. He gave his universal law of gravitation. But his universal law of gravitation was partly derived from Kepler's laws. For example, Newton, in his universal law of gravitation, Newton focused on two, three things. The first one that was that every object attracts every other object. This was something which Newton derived himself, right? Then he told that the, this force is directly proportional to the product of the masses. He also told that this force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the objects. Now this part, that force is inversely proportional to, the, to R square. This part was something which he could derive from Kepler's laws. By looking at the Kepler's laws, he arrived at this inverse square relation of the force of gravitation with the distance between the two objects. Right? So that is why I am giving you a brief idea about Kepler's laws because Kepler's laws were the basis of Newton's universal law of gravitation. So we will not spend much time on Kepler's laws, but let us quickly look at the three laws which were given by Kepler. So here comes Kepler's first law is often also known as the law of orbits. So the first law stated that the orbit of every planet is an ellipse around the sun with sun at one of the two foci of the ellipse. So as I mentioned in the previous slide that there was a scientist named Nicholas Copernicus who told that Every planet moves around the sun in circular path. So Kepler corrected it saying that it is true that every planet moves around the sun, but they do not move in circular orbits. Instead, they move in elliptical path. So where is the sun located in that elliptical path? So the sun is located at one of the foci of the ellipse. So what is the focus of an ellipse? How, what is an ellipse, first of all? Ellipse, is, ellipse looks somewhat like this. So, like for example, when I talk of a circle, there is a center of the circle, right? Because the circle is symmetrical, so you just have one center. But now the ellipse is not that symmetrical as compared to the circle. So, in ellipse, we have two focus. So, these are the two focus in an ellipse. So, the sun lies in one of these focus and so the plural of focus is foci. So the sun lies at one of the foci and the planets move in elliptical orbits. Somewhat like this. Let us take the example of the planet Earth. So the Earth will move in an elliptical path in this fashion and the sun will lie at one of the focus. Right? So this was Kepler's first law. So Kepler's second law is also popularly known as the law of areas because it talks about the areas which are swept by the planet in a specific interval of time. So in this case, let us suppose, let us suppose that initially this planet Earth is at initial is initially at position P1. Let me call this position as P1. Now let us suppose in some time interval, say delta t, it moved from P1 to P2. 
so that means in some time delta t it moved from this point to this point so how much area did it cover if you join the planet with the sun like this so the area covered in time interval in time delta t is this much so this is the area covered in delta t time right now this planet will keep on moving so the planet now let us suppose again the planet is at some point p3 and in another delta t time it reaches some other point p4 that means this portion also it takes to reach from p3 to p4 is again delta t so how much area is swept in delta t in this case so this much area is swept in delta t so the second law says that it sweeps equal areas in equal intervals of time so here the interval of time is equal in both the cases the interval of time is delta t so it says that this area and this area will be same that means for every same interval of time the planet will sweep equal areas well I will not discuss the Kepler's laws in too much of detail now because this is something which you will be studying in your class 11th because I want to tell you how Newton got to know that the force of attraction between two objects is inversely proportional to the square of distance between them. So that is my motto here. So that is why I am just telling you in brief all the three laws of Kepler. Now let us talk about the third law which is the most important law for as of now so kepler's third law is also known as law of periods why because it talked about the time period of the movement of the planet around the sun so it says that the square of the time period of a planet is directly proportional to the cube of the semi major axis of its orbit first of all let us try to understand what is a semi major axis now what kind of orbit is does a planet follow it follows an elliptical orbit so it looks like an ellipse now this ellipse as i mentioned it has got two foci focus 1 and focus 2 this axis is known as semi major axis and this axis is known as semi minor axis so when i talk of uh, an ellipse you should know what is the focus of ellipse what is the semi major axis what is the semi minor axis so Kepler's third law stated that the square of the time period of a planet, time period of a planet means the time it takes to complete one revolution around the sun. That means to complete one round of this ellipse. Whatever time is taken is known as the time period. So this time period square is directly proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So if this is AB, if this is my semi major axis so we will say that t square that is time period square is directly proportional to the cube of the semi major axis where r is the semi major axis so this ab is r so this was kepler's third law which is also known as the law of periods so Kepler could give a lot of information about the planetary motion or the movement of the planets around the sun. He, he told uh, what kind of orbit do planets follow. He also told about the time period of the planets. He also talked about the areas covered by the planets and how are those areas related to time. Right? So Kepler's these three laws were very famous and accepted by everyone at that point of time. Now, based on this Kepler's third law, that is Kepler's law of periods, Newton got this idea that force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the objects. Now, from this, so with this, we will now look at Newton's deduction from Kepler's law. So, how did Newton make use of Kepler's third law? Let us look at that. So, according to Kepler's third law, what did we see? It talked about t square is proportional to r cube or we can say that r cube divided by t square is constant. Right? That is what we can say because if t square is proportional to r cube, so in order to convert it into an equality, we will introduce a constant. So r cube by t square will become a constant. Now, as I mentioned, if this is my sun and if this is the planet, which is moving 
in an elliptical path. So there is some force which is actually binding the planet to the sun as I mentioned before also. So what is that force? That is the centripetal force, right? So we can say that the force acting on the planet. So this force is directly proportional to V square by R because centripetal force is given by M V square R. So this is centripetal force. So I will not discuss about all these things in detail. You will study about them in your higher classes. But just for now, in order to explain you, I am telling you. Centripetal force is given by M V square by R, where R is the radius of the circular path. So here I have assumed for a while. Now see, circle is nothing but a special case of ellipse. So an ellipse who, which has the semi-major axis and semi-minor axis as equal is a circle. So circle is a special case of ellipse. So for now we assume that this ellipse, it, it is a circular path. So we can say that the force is actually proportional to V square by R. Now what is V? V is the velocity of the planet. So V is the velocity of the planet and velocity is given by the total distance travel divided by time taken. So total distance travel is 2 pi R divided by T where T is the time period. Right? So we can say V square is equal to 4 pi square R square divided by T square. So from this we can say V square is proportional to, so this 4 pi square is a constant. So we can say V square is proportional to R square by T square. Right? Therefore, we can say that this force which we were talking about, the centripetal force, is directly pro centripetal force is actually acting between the sun and the planet. So we can say that this force is proportional to V square by R. So instead of V square, we can say R square by T square divided by R. Or we can say F is directly proportional to R by T square. Right? Now we can multiply this with R square and divide this with R square. So this becomes force is directly proportional to R cube by T square into 1 by R square. Now what is R cube by T square? From Kepler's third law we saw that R cube by T square is a constant. So we can say that force is directly proportional to some constant into 1 by r square. So from this we can say that the force between, the force of attraction between the sun and the planet is inversely proportional to r square. Where r is nothing but the distance between the sun and the planet. So from this Newton deduced that the force of attraction between any two objects is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So this is how actually Newton gave his universal law of gravitation. Thank you. Please visit examfear.com to watch free educational videos, try free online tests, get the best quality study materials, study from the best tutors and mentors and much more. Thank you once again.